Thank you. Um, uh, I'll just, some of you might not know my background, so I'll just give a very brief uh, review. Um, I grew up in uh, Canada and I studied my undergraduate degree in a city called Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, which is in sort of the northern part of Canada. And as I was studying it, I became very interested. I, I started to be a math major, but I got math and physics, but I got very interested in geography. <clears throat> I found that I was really fascinated with uh, climatology and microclimatology and so on. So that was my undergraduate degree in, in microclimatology through geography. Um, then I studied a master's degree in landscape architecture, and I wanted to apply the microclimate to uh, design. Um, and fortunately, I came upon a really bright fellow, Terry Gillespie, who was and Ron Stoltz, who were willing to help me to work on that. And so Nobody was really doing very much, well, really anybody doing anything in that area at the time. So I was pioneering all these, you know, sometimes half-baked ideas, Marco, but uh, sometimes they turned out. And, but when I finished my master's degree, I practiced for just a short time as a landscape architect and then decided to go back and do a PhD. And I did it in a field called micrometeorology. And so that sort of solidified the physics behind it. And so um, with those three different backgrounds, then as a faculty member, I gradually sort of pulled them together and I've written some books and, and articles and so on. And so what I'll do today is I'll just give a sort of a, mostly a general overview, a little bit of the theory and a little bit of design. And then maybe in a, some future time, we'll get into a little more detail if you're interested in some of the more uh, nitty gritty details. But we're gonna start in, um, some of you might recognize this place, it's Copenhagen in Denmark, one of the wonderful cities in the world. And there's a, um, this channel, canal uh, is, called, is called Nyhaven Street, which is New Harbor Street in Copenhagen. And I just think this is a fascinating uh, place to look at because you see this beautiful city and, uh, and the canal and so on, but you might or might not have noticed that if you look a little more closely, you see that on the one side of the street, it's active and busy and lots of people. The other side of the street is sort of empty. And when you go down to ground level, you see that on this, south facing side, the sunny side of the street is full of these wonderful outdoor cafes, um, pubs, and people walk up and down this side, you know, all seasons of the year. And it's just a wonderful place to be. And right across the water is the shady side. And it is abandoned. Nobody's there. There is one hotel there, but I think these other buildings are probably law offices or morgues or mortuaries or something. It's a very, very sad side of the street. So this is a really powerful example of what microclimate can do. These are basically two microclimates or maybe even you know, two microclimates on the two sides of the street. And it's very, typical of a northern climate to have this kind of separation. A situation like this in Texas would be exactly the opposite, wouldn't it? The shady side of the street would be the preferred place because it's so hot and so sunny, and the sunny side of the street would be abandoned. And so this is the kind of um, basic idea that links microclimate and design, urban design and landscape architecture. So I'll talk about, uh, as Gong Ying said, I'll talk about microclimatic design, um, a little bit of theory and uh, some application. Um, and I'll just run through some of the things that we've been talking about, but to set the context, um, we know that the uh, urban heat island is, oh, sorry, just a minute, I'm moving things here. Okay. Um, we know that there's global climate change and urban heat island intensification. This is really the foundation of uh, why we're bothering to do what we're doing at microclimatic design. But a lot of people think that global climate change, they say global warming. Well, 
some places it's warming, but some places it's not, and some are wetter and some are drier. But the, the disappointing part is that we're having summers that are getting warmer, but winters that are getting colder. And there's good reason for that, and I can explain that to you if you want from sort of a global perspective. But for the next, probably for the rest of our lifetime, we're going to find colder winters and hotter summers. So it's really the, the worst of both worlds for a lot of places. We're finding that the heat waves are more intense and happening more frequently. Um, there, when people aren't prepared in 2003, that Europe really wasn't prepared for a heat wave and uh, that estimates range, but somewhere around 70,000 people died prematurely because they just didn't have the facility and their cities were designed really for Northern climates. And so they hadn't been designed to really be able to deal with uh, really hot weather. We know that city cores tend to be hotter than countryside. Um, there's a lot of good evidence that emergency medical response calls increase during heat waves. Um, and so the question that uh, I'll ask today and, and try to answer a little bit is, is there anything that landscape architecture and urban planning can do about this? Um, or should we just throw our hands up and, and say we can't manage it? Well, I like to think of climate change at two scales. The one is that the global climate is changing and we really have very little control over it. You know, it, it, we want to do things like reduce our, our carbon footprint and use less energy and so on. But you know, if, if I died tomorrow, it's not going to have any effect on the on the global climate, whether I'm here or not, or whether we all conserve. We're just so minuscule in terms of the big picture that Makoto talked about this last week. Mostly, we just have to adapt to the new climate, and we have to prepare for a different future climate, and um, just basically more or less accept that uh, we can't do anything about that. The local climate is also changing. And we know that the way we build our cities is directly responsible for that. So it's known as urban heat island intensification. And we planners and designers can design and plan places that will modify the urban climate in a positive way. So as long as we separate these two out, we have to deal with the context of global climate, but we can only really act in the local climate. So um, from a theoretical point of view, uh, we have different ways of characterizing the atmospheric environment. The one is weather. Uh, the weather is the atmospheric conditions at a given time and a given place. Um, and we know that it's valuable for deciding what you might wear or whether you wanna to go to the beach that day or something like that. And it provides the context for what we do. So we know that people are more likely to go to an outdoor space on a day that has nice weather. Um, but we really can't control the weather through design. The weather is this prevailing condition and it's just gonna happen no matter what we do. The climate is, um, the prevailing atmospheric conditions. So if you, it's sort of like the you know, average or generalization of the weather. It, it also provides a context for design. So as we saw in Copenhagen, if you're designing a place for a Northern climate like Copenhagen, it really has to be different than the design for a, a tropical climate. But again, we can't really control it through design. But if we look at the microclimate, that's the prevailing atmospheric conditions of a small space. I like to say meters to tens of meters, something like that, but it can actually be smaller than that or larger than that. And this is where the atmospheric environment strongly affects people, plants, buildings, animals, everything. It's, that's where the, the rubber hits the road and that's where things really happen. And we know that the Elements of the microclimate are affected by elements in the landscape. Trees provide shade. 
um, for example. Um, and some parts of the microclimate can be modified through design. That's an important little subtlety that um, is not intuitive at all, but uh, we, we really need to keep in mind that not all parts of the microclimate can be modified, but some of them can. So is there anything that landscape architecture and urban planning can do? And I would say absolutely yes. But the magnitude of the contribution is very different at different scales. So for example, our projects can be carbon neutral um, and we can contribute to the overall effort to reduce global climate change. But no matter what we did, if every landscape architect in the world did this on every project, it's still going to have such a minuscule effect that you know it's it's hardly hardly worth doing. But we have to do it, and uh, th this kind of thing has to be done by governments uh, at, at a world scale. But the local climate change, um, our projects can have an enormous effect on the local climate change. We can completely eliminate the urban heat island and we can create urban cool pools. Um, and planning and design can substantially modify radiation and wind. But this is one that I, you've probably heard me talk about this before. It's so counterintuitive, but we really can't have much effect on the air temperature or the air humidity. Um, in the scientific community, we call it that, that, that it, it's conservative or that it doesn't change much over short distances. Um, and so one of the things I used to like to do in my class was on a hot day, we would take a very, very careful, very fine a temperature measuring instrument, and we would stand in the full sun and we'd measure the air temperature. The last time I did it on Texas a and campus, when I took the temperature, it was um, in Fahrenheit, it was like 92 degrees Fahrenheit. Then we walked over into the shade of a really nice big tree and a nice breeze, and it felt really a lot cooler in there. But when we took the temperature measurement in the shade, it was 92.1 degrees. You know, the air temperature, the air just mixes so efficiently that we really can't have much effect on the air temperature at the local scale. Once you go up a little bit, maybe to the neighborhood scale where you can have a park or something like that, as Makoto and I talked about a couple of weeks ago, you can start to have a bit of an effect one or two degree effect uh, on the adjacent neighborhood or in the park itself. But those are still fairly small when you compare them to the effect of the radiation and the wind. So it sort of helps us to separate out, you know, the things that we can have some effect on and some things we can't. And we really need to focus on radiation and wind. So we'll start with um, the theoretical context, we, it's basically, um, we start, the whole thing is based on energy. It's just basically flows of energy in the landscape. And we remember from our grade school that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. You can't get rid of it. It's, you have to deal with it. If there's energy in the landscape, it has to go somewhere. You can't, can't create new energy and you can't get rid of energy. You can change its form, which is something that we can do in our designs. So some form of energy might be radiant energy. Other forms of energy might be uh, latent energy, as in evaporating water. And so you can do different things with the energy, but you have to do something with it. it you can change its form, and energy can flow from one place to another. So these probably when you learned these in, in grade school, they were pretty theoretical and pretty, you know, didn't mean anything to you. But if you start to think about, you can't really see the energy in the landscape. But if you start to think about how some parts of the landscape are sort of overheated and some are less overheated, you can start to imagine how you might be able to manipulate that energy in different ways. 
And I'll show you just a few ways to do that, but I'd really be happy to talk in more detail later. But we'll start by talking about them as a budget. There's a certain amount of energy that we have in the landscape. Almost all of it comes from the sun, uh, ultimately. We have the, that amount of energy, and then we have to do something with all of that energy. And there are various ways that that energy can be used or moved or the form can be changed. So the main supplier of energy in the landscape is solar radiation. The main consumers then are conduction of heat. So if the energy, if the solar radiation falls on an object and that object heats up or allows the energy to move into the object, we say that it's conducted into an object or into a surface. Um, if there's some water, that energy can be used to turn the water from liquid to vapor. And that's a very efficient way to use energy um, in the landscape. And um, some of it can be convected away by the wind. And just to, to think about it, think about a, a, a hard surface um, a parking lot, for example. If you have the solar radiation falling on that parking lot, it's probably really dry. So there's no opportunity for the energy to go into evaporation. So the dark color, so a lot of that energy will be absorbed and conducted into the parking lot. And we've all experienced how hot a parking lot can be in the, in the summertime when the sun falls on it. And then as the wind moves across, you can sort of think about the wind that um, the air doesn't really get heated by the sun or by any other means other than air molecules touching an, a surface. So if you have some air moving across the landscape and a molecule, say the molecule is at 20 degrees Celsius, if that molecule touches a parking lot that's at 40 degrees Celsius, it will warm up based on having touched that surface. And so as the air moves through the landscape, it quite often is turbulent, it touches the surface and it gets heated by the surfaces and gradually heats up over time. That's what Makoto and I were talking about the other day when we were saying how there's like a, a boundary layer that builds up that lasts for about 150 meters, um, uh, something like that. But it's that, those are the sort of basic mechanisms in the landscape. Once a object gets hot, or actually any object on Earth is emitting radiation at all times. And so it's called terrestrial radiation. Some people call it long wave radiation. But the warmer an object is, the more radiation it emits. So something that's like a hot parking lot, if you're standing near that hot parking lot, you'll be receiving all that terrestrial radiation from the parking lot. The same way as you'd get radiation maybe from a campfire or a, a fireplace or a heater in your house, something like that. So those are really the only places that energy can go. And so I think you can see that if you have a surplus of energy in the landscape, one of the best things you can do is to evaporate some water. So if you, that's one of the reasons that putting water into a landscape can be so effective. If you can put some of that energy into evaporating water, all of a sudden, instead of having the whole amount of energy to deal with, you've got a less amount of energy to deal with. And there are some other things you can do, and I'll sort of go, I'll go through a few of them um, and put them into a little bit of landscape architecture context. So how do we control how much solar radiation arrives at a surface. If we, can, if we can reduce the amount that reaches the surface, that's a, a good strategy as well. And so that's what we do when we put uh, trees in the landscape. And different trees provide different amounts of shade and they have different leaf periods and so on. And this is where the, the design starts to come in because you can have a table like this. And if you look at something like the uh, here, the Quercus rubra, 
uh, down here near the bottom, you can see that in the summertime, it has a certain amount, say between 12 and 23% of the solar radiation passes through that tree. In the wintertime, maybe 70 to 80% passes through. And so this could give you the opportunity to shade an area in the summer and allow the solar radiation through in the wintertime. And then if you look at the, the dates of when it happens, you find that some trees, you maybe notice this in the landscape, some trees get their leaves early and some get it a little later. Some drop their leaves in the fall early and some drop them later. And so in a place like Toronto, uh, it's more effective to use some trees like a Kentucky coffee tree. Some of the trees that have um, compound leaves, they tend to get their leaves later in the spring and they tend to drop them earlier in the fall. So you can have an opportunity to have a warmer spring and a warmer fall and extend the, the summer season. Uh, other places, it's better to have trees that leaf out early, but you can become quite strategic about how you choose your trees so that they will leaf and drop their leaves when you want them to. Here's an example of a thermal image of a, a street in, in Toronto, Guelph. Um, and the shadows are sort of instructive here because this blue blob over here is a, what's called a Norway maple, uh, Acer platinoides. Very, very heavy canopy, heavy leaves, uh, very little solar radiation gets through. And look at the area in the shade of that tree. It's around five, or six degrees Celsius under that tree. Over here, where I am standing, the green and yellow over here, I'm standing in the shade of a birch tree, which is quite open, quite, uh, quite a bit of solar radiation comes through. And you can see that the temperature, I don't have it on the scale here, but the temperature would be around 15 degrees Celsius over here in the shade of the uh, um, birch tree. And then out in the full sun, it's around 26 degrees. So you're seeing quite a big difference, 20 degrees Celsius difference, um, just between two areas that are like maybe a meter apart in the landscape. And this is the kind of thing that you can uh, control through your design. So that's, first of all, intercepting some more radiation. How about uh, controlling how much is absorbed by a surface? Well, we have, uh, a couple of things. One is the angle of the surface relative to the sun has a big impact on how much energy is received. So uh, the angle of the surface and also the reflectivity. So some surfaces will reflect more. So a lighter colored surface tends to reflect more than a darker colored surface. And we call that the albedo of the surface. And um, here's an example of if you have the sun coming straight down, straight overhead, and you have a flat surface, you can see that in this case, this is getting around a thousand watts per meter square. If you had, a, say, a hill or a building or something that was at a 45 degrees, that same amount of energy, thousand watts per meter squared, is now spread over more than a meter squared. And so you're only getting 700 watts per meter squared on that. It's the same environment, the same amount of sun coming down, but by tipping the surface, we're reducing the amount, the intensity of the radiation. And then if you tip it even further, you can see that you can reduce it even more. And so the more, the, the more we call it normal, the more normal a surface is to the sun, the more intensity of radiation. So when you think about it, most places, the sun isn't directly overhead, is it? It's in this sort of rises in the east, but passes through the southern sky. And so if you have a surface, a hillside, say, that's oriented towards the south, then the sun coming in is almost normal to it, almost perpendicular to it. So a south-facing slope in a northern climate can be the highest intensity of radiation. And so you can actually modify that to get the amount of energy that you want in, in a landscape. And then in terms of um, the reflectivity, 
we see quite a range uh, in natural surfaces. Uh, some things like you can see here, grass might be 20 to 30% reflected, but 70 to 80% is absorbed. Um, something like uh, water, if the sun is low in the sky, most of that will be reflected. If the sun is high, most of it will be absorbed. But then when you look at some things like asphalt, for example, almost all of the solar radiation that falls on asphalt is going to be absorbed. And interestingly, concrete, even though it's quite a light color, still a lot of it is absorbed. And one of the reasons for that, I, I won't go into too much detail today, but I'd be happy to talk about it. About half of the radiation that comes from the sun is visible, but the other half is invisible to our eye. And so the, when we see something like a white paint, it's very effective at reflecting the visible part of the uh, solar spectrum, but the near infrared part of the solar spectrum, the invisible to our eye, even white paint will absorb virtually all of the near infrared. So when we think about painting surfaces, white or light colors or doing that, we're probably having less than half as big an impact as we think we might be having because that near infrared is just being gobbled up in, by that surface. Um, terrestrial radiation is invisible, but we can, as, we, as many of us know, we can uh, use a thermal camera to see it. And here is an example. On the one side, we can see this looks like an ice green soccer field with ice green. We sometimes see the surfaces um, as high as like maybe 80 degrees or even hotter. And when we, uh, this is an example of a, um, what I would consider a, a design example. If we have, uh, I don't know if Wen Wen's on the, on the call today or not, but Wen Wen and I did a study and we looked at a, uh, some soccer fields around Guelph or around <laughs> Bryan College Station. And we modeled what the children who were playing soccer would be experiencing, what the coach standing on the sidelines would be experiencing, and what the parents sitting over there in the shade of a tree would be experiencing. And the, the parents would be clearly very comfortable. The coach would be a little bit warm, but the kids would be receiving so much radiation. It'd be like they, they're playing soccer on a hot stovetop. Um, and so the kids could very well be getting dangerously high levels of heat. And meanwhile, the coach and the parents are thinking, why is my kid not running any faster? You know, it's a really nice day and they're, they're, they look lazy out there, but they're probably really, really hot. So this is something that we need to think about as we're um, designing. I'm not going to suggest that we shouldn't use artificial turf in Guelph or in Toronto, this is actually really effective because most of our sports teams play in September and October and November when it's rainy and snowy and cold and muddy. And these work really well in that kind of condition. But when you put them in a place like Texas, Central Texas, uh, and then you have summer camps for kids uh, to play soccer, it's really potentially a, a very dangerous situation. So I was going to show you an example of a um, solar radiation, terrestrial radiation, invisible radiation in a, a, a design setting. There's a place in Canada called Winnipeg, Assiniboine Park, a beautiful park. They built this wonderful new building, very interesting architectural building. And, they, and you can see in the middle of it here, they have a, an outdoor cafe. Inside they have a cafe and then you can sit outside. So I was really looking forward to sitting outside in the outdoor cafe. And when we got there, the only table that was available was this one by the door. And you can see all these other people are sitting under the shade of umbrellas. And even this one is under the shade of an umbrella. So you think, well, that's good. It's a warm day, but we'll sit in the shade of the umbrella. We sat there and within about two minutes, I thought, I'm, I'm gonna die. 
why is this so hot? And then I realized, look at this wonderful design feature of, uh, uh, I, I guess it's some kind of iron, iron wall that's you know, gorgeous to look at, but it's facing to the south. This wall was so hot that I couldn't even get my hand close enough to test the temperature of it, it was so hot. And it was throwing off so much terrestrial radiation that we couldn't sit at this table. So we got up and said, we got to sit somewhere else. So we sat over in the shade. And as we ate our meal, I saw any number of people come and sit at this table. And about two minutes later, call the waiter, waitress over and say, can we move? <laughs> can we move? <laughs> and so this is an example of this invisible element in the landscape that's a design feature. It looks beautiful. It's causing an absolutely terrible microclimate uh, for their outdoor cafe. Um, let's switch for a minute to controlling the amount of convective cooling from the surface. So we've dealt a little bit with radiation. We'll do a little bit with, with wind now. Um, when we talk about convective cooling, as I was saying before, the wind moves over a surface, the molecules touch the surface, they get excited by the surface, they actually increase their energy level, and then they pick up that heat and carry it away. Um, two things to notice about that. One is if you double the wind, if you quadruple the wind speed, you only double the amount of cooling. It's the square root of the wind speed. So the wind is less effective uh, in terms of uh, increasing the wind speed and, and less effective in cooling at, than you think. But the more important issue is that the wind will only cool things that are uh, a higher temperature than the wind. So if the wind is at 10 degrees Celsius and your skin is at 30 degrees Celsius, then there's a 20 degrees Celsius difference. And so the wind will carry heat away from your body. If the wind is uh, 30 degrees Celsius and your body is 30, your skin is 30 degrees Celsius, that 30 degrees Celsius wind is touching your body, but it's not actually gaining any energy, is it? It can't, it can't heat up past 30 degrees. And in fact, if the air is 40 degrees and there's a wind, that wind will actually, it'll be negative convection if you want to think of it that way. It'll actually make you hotter over time. So when we think about people during a heat wave and we, often think about if we're going to cool ourselves, we would like to have a fan. And so sometimes during heat waves, governments think that they're doing a good thing. So they buy fans and give them to elderly people whose houses don't have air conditioning. And if the air temperature is really high and a person sits in front of that fan, they actually will be adding heat to their body. And we see there's, there's no smoking gun, there's no uh, definitive answer to this, but a lot of people who die during heat waves are people who are in air conditioned, un-air un conditioned homes, but they have a fan and they've been using that fan and it's actually made them hotter um, than not having the fan. And so there's another example of how we need to really think about the the, the physics behind what we're doing um, in the landscape. One of the things that is very valuable in terms of considering the wind in design is to look at the directions that the wind blows from in different seasons. So in July in Dallas, the wind almost always blows from the south or just a little bit uh, beside that. So if we're going to try to cool an area by allowing the wind to pass through it, we know exactly where the wind is going to be coming from. There's no sense leaving openings like Makoto was showing in, in Tokyo, trying to get the air to move from the harbor into the center of the city. If you had a big opening over here on the north or the east or the west, the wind isn't traveling in that direction. So it's not going to be carrying that cooler air. In January, we have an interesting situation. It's almost always from the north or from the south, very little from the sides. 
So that gives us an opportunity to think about how we can maybe reduce the cold winds in January with some wind breaks on the north. And uh, then we have a little bit of a dilemma because we might want to reduce the winds from the south in the wintertime, um, but uh, not in the summertime. But then, I didn't bring this next diagram, but then you can do something called conditional climatology or conditional wind diagrams. If we went into the data set from January and we said, show us the wind directions when the temperature is, well, it's in Dallas, so I'll talk about Fahrenheit. Show us the wind direction when the temperature is below 40 degrees Fahrenheit and show us the wind directions when the wind is above 40 degrees. I think what we'd see is that the winds from the north are the cold winds, the winds from the south are the moderate winds. And so by going one step further, we can confidently say we should have wind breaks that are to the north and we, should, we can leave it open to the south because even in the middle of winter, those winds from the south are not going to be cold winds, they're gonna be moderate winds. So when we think about the uh, cooling effect of trees, we talk about it, they intercept solar radiation, they shade surfaces, and those surfaces that are shaded by the trees are cooler than unshaded surfaces. And the cooler a surface is, the less terrestrial radiation they emit. So there's sort of a double advantage there. And we know that heat, air is heated by contact with the surfaces it isn't really heated directly by the sun. The sun passes essentially right through the air and doesn't heat it up. So we really do want to plant a lot of trees in urban areas. We've all talked about that. And we do know that it has the potential to reduce the urban heat island effect, but we need to be strategic in a number of ways. I'll just show you two ways that we need to think about it, but there are several others as well. But we need to first of all make sure we select the right species and then the right location. We've already talked about the right species in terms of leafing period, uh, transmissivity, how much interception it has and so on. But there's another element that's sort of fascinating uh, about um, which species to select. So um, if you don't know about this, I'm sorry to tell you that trees cause air pollution. Some trees cause air pollution. Um, and it's a, a way back when, um, anyway, it turns out that some trees contribute to ozone smog because they emit hydrocarbons. And these hydrocarbons interact with nitrous ox nitrogen oxides from vehicles and in sunny conditions, they can form smog. So places like Los Angeles used to have smog they thought they'd get rid of it by planting a lot of trees and by golly, didn't they get worse smog? And so finally, a few years ago, we figured out, I wasn't part of the discovery, but figured out that some trees actually cause smog. But um, I did help a little bit with this study that is, how do we know which species are bad and which are not so bad? And so when you look at it, you can actually measure it. And some of the high emitters are things like uh, eucalyptus trees, populus, quercus, and so on. Um, and some of the low uh, hydrocarbon emitters are, depends on which zone you're in, but some of the pines, some of the jacarandas, some of the ashes, and so on. But there are lists that people have been putting together. And we should, if we're in a high urban area, we should just be concerned about not planting the high biogenic uh, species in the city. Second thing in terms of location, we should locate them in critical hot spots. Things like asphalt parking lots, exposed west facing walls. We should find these hot spots in the city and then we should um, plant our trees to, to make those cooler. I'm gonna skip a couple of these because I wanna show you this condo and I realize that I'm talking too much, <laughs> talking too long, but there's a, um, Vancouver, Canada, there was a, a very wonderful Japanese architect, Shigeru Ben, who uh, was hired to design uh, a, an amazing condominium in Vancouver. 
And my good friend, Cornelia Hanoverlander, was hired as a landscape architect. I think I told her she just passed away last year at 99 years old. She was still uh, practicing up until the very end. But um, just to give you an idea, here is um, a, a close up of the city of Vancouver. And you note here that we have the ocean and we have the mountains. And so it's a really wonderful uh, location for a city. And here's our site where we're right on the harbor and in the background are mountains. So we have the mountains, snow-capped mountains in the background, and then we have the ocean uh, right in front of us. And when we look at the site a little bit more, you can see how popular it is with all the high-rise buildings. And our building is going to be right in here at 1250 West Hastings. Here's a, a harbor and, and so on. If we zoom in, we see that this is a really iconic Canadian building designed by a very famous Canadian architect. And Shigeru decided to pick up some of the character of that building. You can see it was really the first one that uh, had these terraces with uh, uh, leafy things hanging over the edges and so on. And it's, really a wonderful uh, design. And so Shigeru picked up on that in his design. Um, and now here, I'll just give you a, a brief overview of the microclimatic design that went into this. Cornelia, any project she got, she would phone me and she'd say, Bob, I want you to be on this project and I want, I want it to be microclimatically designed. And so this, this one was, and I'll run through some of it with you. Uh, it, I can't do it all, but here's where we started. Here's the blue building is the outline of our new building. We had to make sure that we didn't cast any shadow on a, a very popular local park because some of these other buildings did. And so we showed that yes, indeed, our, our building doesn't cast any shadow on that. But look at the um, windrows for this location. A lot of wind from the Northwest and a lot of the wind from the Southeast. Look at the orientation of the street, northwest to southeast. And so the wind's either going to be flowing up this street or down this street. And with all these big buildings around, we're going to be squeezing the wind into areas. And as you squeeze the wind between buildings, it'll speed up um, as it goes through there, those areas. The other thing that happens is the wind at the surface is the lowest. And as you go above the surface, the wind increases in speed. And so if you have a tall building like this one, at the bottom, there's not too much wind, but at the top, if the wind is coming from this direction, it hits that, it'll be going a lot faster because it's above the ground. Some of that wind will go up and over the building, some will go around, but some of it will actually come down the face of the building and flow out the front. And it seems, again, counterintuitive, but sometimes you'll be walking towards a tall building and the wind will be coming, it seems to be coming right out of the building at you. And that's because it carries its momentum all the way down to the ground and then has this strong flow away from the building. So you can see that our building on the one side, the far side, is going to be directly receiving Northwest winds, which typically are the cold wind, colder winds. So this was one of the things we had to think about was the winds. And um, here is uh, uh, an image of the building. And I'll just run through, through a few things um, that, uh, uh, that illustrate what I'm talking about. The one is, so the wind from the Northwest will hit this surface, it'll come down. And you can see all of these uh, condos and apartments here have these outdoor terrace areas. And this wind is going to come down, it's going to be coming really fast and it's gonna be impossible to use these areas. I was talking to my, a friend of mine who lives on the 23rd floor of a condominium in Toronto. And I asked him if he was barbecuing and he says, I can't barbecue. I can't even get a match lit outside. It's so windy that there's no way to barbecue. So what we did was we put these nice overhangs over top, I'll show you another example, over top of each terrace so that the wind is shunted away from the building. 
And let me go ahead one. You can see a little bit right here, you can see these awnings that, so the wind catches the wind, it's coming down really fast. It'll be pushed out there, it'll be pushed out there. And um, this area will stay a lot less windy. We also have these vegetation all along the edge and you have a little bit of uh, um, uh, friction like that. It'll also help to slow the wind down. Um, and, uh, and then there's a whole bunch of other things we did with the wind. But I wanna to talk to you also about the solar radiation because when you're in these units, one of the reasons people wanna be there is to look at the ocean and to look at the mountains. But think about how high the solar radiation level would be in these units. And so it was a, quite a challenge to figure out what to do. But what we ended up doing was we ended up using essentially vertical slats that will uh, angle so that you can see between them to see the mountains or see between them to see the sea, but that they would be keeping the solar radiation from overheating the building. So every single part of this building is designed from a microclimate point of view, both inside and out. And here's an example of what it's like uh, where the basically inside of the building and the outside of the building, you can open the wall completely and then you can have this wonderful view of the mountains if you want, but it's it really the inside and the outside come together. And this overhang over the top is going to make sure that you don't have any wind in there and, and you get the idea. And then you can even have a bath and, and look out over the mountains if you want. <laughs> So I'll, uh, I'm sorry, I'm using my whole time, but we can plan and design places that will modify urban microclimates in a positive way by controlling the flows of energy. We can control the amount of solar radiation that reaches a surface, the amount that is absorbed, how much energy is emitted as terrestrial and how much heat is carried away by the wind or by water. So it's like we, we have control of these taps and we can, turn things up and turn things down and create our, our wonderful microclimate by making sure the energy goes to the right place. But we really can't have much effect on temperature or humidity. We just have to accept that and, and people won't believe you when you tell them anyway. So uh, shade critical hot spots, such as exposed west facing walls, open parking lots, and any place where you expect that people will be. And then, um, plant deciduous trees, that's, that's an old one, isn't it? The shade in the summer, a lot of the sun to pass through in the, in the winter time. And uh, block the winter winds and allow the summer winds to pass through places where people will be. Okay. And I, I have to show you, many of you have seen this picture, it's one of my favorite pictures, it's in Adelaide, Australia. Jermaine uh, Greer was giving a reading from her book and it was a really hot sunny day and the people who arrived late had the option to either stand in the sun and get really, really hot, but see her, be close, or sit further away and be thermally comfortable. And so every palm around there had all these people sitting in the shade. And as the sun moved through the sky, every once in a while, everybody had to sort of scoosh forward to, stay, to make sure everybody stayed in the shade. But again, a, a really powerful example of how important the microclimate is for uh, people in the landscape. So I will stop there and answer any questions you have or any comments you have.